One thing that is really hard when you're going into the off season, I think, is having something behind the plan that you're going to do. It's really easy to have a lot of guesswork. One thing that the biomechanics lab and the motion capture data gives us is it eliminates a lot of that. The motion capture lab really gives us a piece of data. It tells us exactly how you move. So with Dylan, being able to understand exactly how he was moving back in 2019 to develop an actual roadmap and plan around, are we gonna change our mechanics? And if we are, what specifically are we trying to change as we kind of like move through this, this training program? Hey, I'm Anthony Brady, Director of Sports Science, Drive On Baseball, talking today a little bit about some of the work that we've done with Dylan Tate and how we leverage biomechanics data, specifically in this case at the big league level. So winter 2019, Dylan came in for the first time. Again, his debut was summer of, of 2019, and we knew when he was coming into his assessment that his ceiling was a lot higher. Uh, there'd been plenty of reports from when he was drafted and even his time in college that he was up to 98 back then. So. Right away, we had a pretty good feeling that his ceiling could have been a lot higher. And when we got him in the motion capture lab, we took a look at some of the biomechanics data we collected on him, specifically trying to pinpoint a couple variables that we thought he could work on and, and maybe develop. We could improve some velocity, get him back to that ceiling. And right away, there were two major things that stuck out. His shoulder horizontal abduction was, it was good. It was about average for our elite throwers group, which is some of the harder throwers in our database. And he, he was throwing, I wanna say around like 92 at the time during the mocap, so a decent velocity, but still not quite as hard as we knew he could throw. The other thing that we noticed in the report was he wasn't creating a lot of hip shoulder separation, or at least as much as we think a, uh, an athlete of his caliber can and should, throwing at super elite velocities up into the upper 90s. So we really pinpointed and focused on those two metrics. Can we kind of eke out a little more shoulder horizontal abduction uh, or scap retraction, scap load, and also can we, can we get a little more hip shoulder separation out of him. Those were kind of the two focuses that, that we really kind of honed in on. So once the assessment is kind of done and we have the biomechanics report, really trying to dial in that, that scap retraction, clean up the torso, get a little more hip shoulder separation. You know, the, the sports scientist staff, they'll work with Bill, uh, our director of pitching and the, the pitching trainers to kind of like formulate a plan for how Dylan is going to target these while he's training here. Over the course of a few months of training in the off season, we felt pretty good that mechanically we were starting to trend in the right direction. Then uh, Dylan went off and, and had his uh, 2020 campaign that year. Average velocity jumped up quite a bit. We also saw his peak velocity increase as well. So we saw pretty promising and exciting results on the field. Uh, but more importantly, to really take a data-driven approach, we needed to get a, a retest data point from Dylan. After the 2020 season was, was over, Dylan came back out. We got another motion capture uh, assessment. We were able to take another biomechanics report from him. And that's where we really found that a few of those changes we were really trying to make, they had improved in the direction that we were looking to, uh, to see them move in. So in Dylan's retest, after that 2020 season, when we looked at the arm action, we saw some of the changes we were looking to kind of create. Scap retraction improved going from, I think it was 46 degrees of, of max scap retraction up to 58. So we started to see him closer to that higher velocity group that we see in our database, getting, getting a little more back there with that humerus. Also, his max external rotation increased, and we saw about a, a nine to 10 degree increase there, which is likely from a more efficient arm action, is deploying a bit better, getting a little more layback which we also see in a lot of our harder throwers. And then for hip shoulder separation, we also saw some promising changes there. Dylan was able to stay a little more counter-rotated with his trunk. Previously in his first assessment, he was landing at about 17 degrees. So he's pretty open and facing the plate during his retest. He was actually staying more closed. It wasn't too large of a change. I wanna say it was like seven to eight degrees down to around a, a 10 degree trunk angle of foot plant. And that also resulted in some increases in hip shoulder separation. We went from 20 degrees of hip shoulder separation up to around 30, 32, creating that, you know, maximally and a foot plant. Yeah, so it's tough to kind of attribute all of Dylan's, you know, performance and, and velocity increases and changes just to those biomechanical metrics alone. Actually, I wouldn't even say that those are the only reasons his velocity increases. Obviously, there's a ton of other things that come into play. The way he approaches recovery, making sure that, you know, he's getting in the weight room, following his programming, all that stuff, not to mention the um, hours and hours of work that he's, he's done with Bill and some of our other 
other trainers on the floor, in, in drills, on the plyo wall. It's just too hard to kind of say that because Dylan changed these metrics, we saw these results. And that's, that's also not the point of this. The point is that, you know, taking a data-driven approach, we identified, you know, some points in the data that we collected in the biomechanics reports with Dylan that we thought could really aid and improve him as a player. We developed a plan around kind of, you know, changing those directionally. We wanted to increase them in certain areas, maybe decrease them in other, and we executed on that plan. We then tested it again and saw that the changes that we wanted to make, we were able to make. So we can feel pretty confident that when future athletes come in, continuing to prescribe uh, and leverage these uh, data-driven approaches to working with biomechanics data, that we're gonna get the same amount of, of results. You know, We've definitely been wrong before in terms of how we think about pitching mechanics and, and how we approach working with athletes and making changes to each one. But I think those are actually times when we we learn the most about what we think we know about pitching mechanics, and that really helps us fine tune our models and understand you know, what metrics can change, how they can change, how that impacts performance. This was one of the many cases where things ended up great. You know, Dylan, to give him the credit that he really deserves and, and not us, he's an incredibly hard worker and stuck to the plan and, and, and really believed in it and committed to it, and that helps a lot too. But at the end of the day, taking the data and really formulating um, an actionable plan that the athlete can follow, kind of the most important thing.